Today's author, Rebecca Traster, is a senior writer at Salon.com and has been covering women in politics and media since 2003. Rebecca has written for the New York Observer, Elle, The Nation, Vogue, Glamour, New York Magazine, The New York Times, including many others. We are so delighted to have Rebecca and for her to discuss the book which will examine the crucial female roles in the 2008 election and onward. Rebecca has chronicled the recent presidential election from a perspective not heard widely before. As we celebrate the 20th anniversary of Snell Library this year, Northeastern looks to expand the program and grow our Meet the Author series. To start the 20th anniversary year off right, help me to welcome Rebecca Traster. Thanks, guys, for coming. Um, I love a reading room that has pizza in it. That's excellent. Um, so I, the book is Big Girls Don't Cry, the election that changed everything for American women. And I'm going to read a few um, short selections from it, three. And I really encourage all of you, if you have questions, comments, if I say something you vociferously disagree with, um, if you have your own memories or observations about the election and your participation in it, your feelings about it, I really encourage you, so far when I've, I've done a couple of these, the absolute best part is the discussion after. It's not me going on from the book. So um, have questions ready. The other thing is that the moment where I say, does anybody have a question, there's an awkward like two minute pause before anybody wants to ask the first question. So I offer some kind of prize like a whole pizza or something to, <laughs> to the person who immediately shoots their hand in the air to ask the first question. Um, this book, uh, it does tell the story of the 2008 presidential election from a feminist perspective. Um, it uses the election, which was this kind of riveting narrative. I don't know if you guys remember it well, um, if you were active campaigners, participants, supporters of any of the candidates. Um, but it was one of the best elections to use as the basis for a story <laughs> that I can think of because there were so many twists and turns, so many compelling characters. Um, but it's not really a campaign book. It's using the election um, as the story, as a lens through which to examine hundreds of years of women's history and social progress in the United States. Um, and it's also using the election, regarding it as a, as a moment, as a catalytic moment. Um, an election that was, as it was happening, was changing our history. It was changing the way that we saw women in politics, women competing, women refusing to comply. We still see those women refusing to comply. Um, so in addition to something that shed light on hundreds of years of history, it was also an election that I think is going to cast a shadow over hundreds of years um, in the future. I mean, we're two years out and we're talking about Mama Grizzlies and Sarah Palin and yesterday there was a huge flare-up of the recurrent rumor that Hillary Clinton is going to run with Barack Obama as his vice presidential candidate um, in 2012. Um, we are seeing women in politics remain in the news, in the headlines, in our conversation, in ways that they simply weren't just three years ago. Um, so that's why I wrote the book. It's not, it's not strictly just about the election. It's about the sort of tentacles um, forward and backward of the election. And I'm going to read three very brief um, sections. And I hope that they make sense, because I do use the election as the, and the timeline as the frame for the book. Um, the first section is just a brief one. There's a chapter about intergenerational feminism and about some of the discord between younger women and older women, um, mostly over how they felt about Hillary Clinton and her campaign. Um, and I'm going to read you just a small section of that. Uh, does anybody remember the Obama girl video, the I've got a crush on Obama? Yes, the YouTube and she danced around in her underwear? Yeah. OK. And the lyrics were, in part, I cannot wait till 2008. Baby, you're the best candidate. Up in the Oval Office, you'll get your head of state. I can't leave you alone, because I've got a crush on Obama. So went the hook of a brain-eating brain ditty that lit up the internet in 2007. The viral Obama girl video starred a pneumatic 26-year-old model, Amber Lee Ettinger, who swum, swung her hip-hugger Obama panties to the beat and presented America with its first vision 
of what youthful female support of Barack Obama looked like. Though the clip was meant to be comedic, the vision of Ettinger boogieing in her bikini, inviting Obama to Barack her tonight, ca came terribly close to how the media would portray one half of a generational divide amongst Democratic women. In the media's eye, Obama girls were the post-feminist sylphs who had fallen for Barack and cared not a bit for the earnest politics of their elders. Angry, punishing harpies who did not dance in their underwear but shook their pruny fists as young women rejected not just Hillary, but them and the women's liberation they had given their lives for. These characterizations reflected the wishful thinking of a media hungry for any tale that might involve both a catfight and the implosion of feminism. But a white male press could not fairly be blamed for imposing a self-serving template on this tale of generational strife. Responsibility fell squarely at the feet of the ladies themselves. Women on both sides of the genera generational chasm who were airing their shrill differences and infusing them with a desperate gravity, as if they had been spoiling for a fight for years. In fact, they had been, and their conflicts had very little to do with Hillary Clinton, but swirled instead around the future and what remained of the women's movement. From many angles, the old versus young setup was grossly exaggerated. The briefest scan of any Hillary rally turned up teenage girls cheering for her with a force that threatened to pop their heads off their bodies, high school guys offering restrained applause, demure 20-something couples listening attentively. Even Obama girl Amber Ettinger confessed that she, quote, was very impressed with Hillary Clinton. I watched the recent debates and I like a lot of her answers. There were also plenty of middle-aged women, including the well-known writers and pundits Barbara Ehrenreich, Katha Pollitt, Eve Ensler, and Arianna Huffington flocking to the Obama campaign. But the nuanced story was not as much fun to tell as the one in which the young women of America were thoughtless, thoughtlessly brushing off not only Hillary Clinton, but with her their commitment to female political empowerment. It was true that throughout the primary season, young people, including young women, turned out in unprecedented numbers to vote for Barack Obama, while Hillary's most reliable base consisted of white women over 40. The reasons for this dynamic began with the fact that the Clinton campaign was not good at addressing young people, and the Obama campaign was great at it. If John and Elizabeth Edwards had been prescient in hiring bloggers as a way into the net roots, which happened earlier in the story, um, then Obama's use of technology, from blogs to Facebook to text messaging, was masterful. Obama did not assume that young voters were consuming the same culture or watching the same news that their parents were. He went to where they lived, where they socialized, to their phones and to their college campuses. There's some stuff about the strategy of the Obama campaign. And then the only way that Hillary managed to cotton on to the fact that she had an age, a generational problem. In the weeks before Super Tuesday, Clinton engaged her deeply private 27-year-old daughter to speak at campuses. Chelsea was perhaps the sturdiest of all of Hillary's personal credentials, and so effective a stand-in for her mom that, as the New York Times reported, at an hour-long February appearance at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, this kind of breaks my heart, she nimbly held forth on, quote, Medicare Part D, the distinction between the chronically and occasionally uninsured, health care premium caps, Pell Grant allowance maximums, income contingency repayment programs for, my, for financial aid, sugar-based ethanol and carbon sequestration, <laughs> Romanian reproductive policy, and the design of the internal combustion engine. The Tracy, Flick the Tracy Flick genes were strong, and Chelsea was a whiz. But she could not compete with Obama, who'd been beguiling undergrads for more than a year with limpid lines like, I've become a vehicle for your hopes and your dreams, but I can only carry it so far. It's going to be you who carry it forward. He meant it, and he was proved right. The Obama campaign was so grassroots that kids themselves were self-starting campaign initiatives, making their own buttons and pamphlets. Clinton still shipped in the machinery from out of town. In March, the young feminist Shelby Knox was dismayed when she arrived in her hometown of Lubbock, Texas, as a Clinton volunteer and found no Clintonites in sight. Meanwhile, she said, there were Obama supporters from the college on every street and Obama signs everywhere. A speaker at colleges around the country, Knox knew that there was an eager youthful following for Clinton, but when she walked into campaign headquarters, quote, it was literally all older white women from out of town. The women explained that their unfamiliarity with Lubbock meant that they weren't sure which thoroughfares to populate. Knox marshaled the Feminist Alliance from Texas Tech University, asking them, regardless of your political beliefs, can you please help me? With her hastily recruited collegiate volunteers, she canvassed Lubbock, holding signs for Hillary. 
Hillary wound up winning Lubbock, but as Knox learned, quote, Hillary campaigns around the country were being run by older white women, which was so unfortunate. Younger women were there for the asking. It's just that nobody, except for Barack Obama, was asking them. Uh, I'm now skipping ahead. Uh, to a later portion. <clears throat> this is one of the only portions of the book where I'm actually critical of Barack Obama. I, I've always liked Barack Obama and I was a fervent supporter of his in the general election. Um, this comes in a chapter that's about the final stages of that very, very long drawn out primary battle. Um, I think this is, this is uh, placed in the middle of the very intense Pennsylvania primary um, when it was really getting quite ugly and there was an enormous amount of pressure on Hillary Clinton to drop out. Um, she was doing damage to Obama. And these final two sections are from that moment in the race. One of the more ineffable complaints about Obama was that his team was a little too masculine, a little too fratty for comfort. Like Clinton's, Obama's campaign was designed by men. But unlike Clinton's, it was also largely staffed by men. With the crucial exceptions of Valerie Jarrett and later Anita Dunn, his closest advisors and strategists were men, and the vibe of the campaign, as described by both reporters covering it and those who did business with it, was clubby, sports-obsessed, and testosterone-fueled. Conversations within the ranks, conversation within the ranks was dotted with buddy and man, dude talk, the kind of backslapping repartee in which men, including some of the men in the media, could participate, but to which women found no easy entrance. There would be a spate of stories in September 2008 about how women working for Obama in the Senate made an average of 83 cents for every dollar made by men working in the same office. The numbers were misleading, but the explanation for the wage discrepancy was not particularly comforting. The average female sal salary was lower than the average male salary, not because women were being paid less for the same jobs, but because they were not in the highest level and best remunerated positions. Of Obama's five highest paid staffers, only one was female, and only seven of his top 20. In May, Peggy Agar, a reporter for the Detroit ABC affiliate station, approached Obama during his visit to the Chrysler LLC plant, asking, Senator, how are you going to help the American auto workers? Obama waved Agar off, saying, hold on one second, sweetie. The clip gained YouTube traction, and within hours, Obama had left a message for Agar apologizing for failing to answer her question and for referring to her as sweetie. He called his use of the word, quote, a bad habit. His apology was timely and polite, but he was right. He had a bad sweetie habit. He had addressed a female factory worker in Allentown, Pennsylvania by the same diminutive, and ABC soon found footage of him telling an, another female, an, a female supporter, sweetie, if I start with a picture, I'll never get out of here. And another, sweetie, if I start doing, out, if I start doing autographs, I won't be able to get out. The remark generated the opposite of outrage from the media. On Good Morning America, a practically purring Diane Sawyer asked, don't you think it's going too far to care about that stuff? Actually, no, it was not going too far to care about that stuff. To care about it did not mean that people should have changed their votes or their minds about Obama and his candidacy. But caring about that stuff was the only way to understand how language can convey diminishment, whether that diminishment is based on gender, race, age, or power. Sweetie redolent of sugar and spice and all the rest of that stuff that little girls are supposed to be made of, is an endearment. It's a warm word. Many women, myself included, enjoyed being called sweetie by the people they care about. That did not mean that we would have enjoyed being addressed that way by a presidential candidate, especially in response to a question about the future of American auto workers, and especially when the word was part of a larger professional brush off. Was it the most sexist thing a man could say to a woman? Certainly not. But whereas racially inflected remarks from Clinton had been poured over and parsed, the media seemed eager to sidestep the fact that Obama's reliance on the sweetie diminutive reflected some basic patriarchal attitudes. Much of the defensive maneuvering happened around the question of whether his elocution was premeditated or malevolent. Surely it was neither. As Whoopi Goldberg said on The View, the senator likely, quote, meant no disrespect. But good intentions don't render anyone incapable of disrespect or condescension. Any more than a good record on race rendered Bill Clinton incapable of disrespect and condescension in South Carolina. Words are often both spontaneous and sexist. The merry masculinity of Obama and his team was shrugged off as no big deal. 
but it was persistent enough to continue to draw attention after the primaries and into his administration. When, in December of 2008, photos surfaced of Obama's wunderkind speechwriter John Favreau groping the breast of a cardboard cutout of Hillary Clinton, he apologized but was not publicly reprimanded or dismissed by his boss. He was hired to work in the White House. Less than a year into Obama's presidency, the New York Times ran a front page story about the president's habit of playing golf and basketball with high and mid-level male staffers. The sports-heavy, lady-light vibe of an Obama White House made critics uncomfortable. While the choice of how and with whom to blow off steam might seem an awfully benign thing to get bent out of shape over, this was precisely the kind of pastime that throughout history had ensured the unceasing replication of patriarchal power structures. Those who play ball, golf, cards, who smoke cigars and drink bourbon while speaking informally of power and policy are the ones who have the boss's ear, who understand him best and can manipulate him most successfully. Barack Obama, the man with a silver tongue but a tin ear for lots of things having to do with women, should have known this but apparently didn't. He called the controversy about his all-boys basketball, ga basketball games bunk. And in the words of reporter Mark Leibovich, he defended himself against the notion that the time spent with male advisors sent any kind of message, in part by, quote, pointing out that he is surrounded by strong females at home. This was an argument that not only echoed one made by George W. Bush, George w. Bush's female adherents, who had equated respecting women with being henpecked by them, but also stank of, long, stank of long entrenched sexism. Of course Obama was surrounded by women at home. That is one of the oldest gendered circumstances known to humankind. Women at home are where they have always been. The question Leibovich and many of Obama's critics were getting at was where the women were at work. And then this is the last part and it's right after Hillary has won the very hotly contested brutal Pennsylvania primary. And she won it in an ugly fashion, and everything about the primary was ugly, including the response to her eventually winning it. <coughs> True to form, the media did not react to Clinton's Pennsylvania win by sending her flowers. Instead, her victory seemed to elicit an unprecedented wave of aggression. The calls for her to drop out became pointed, propelled now by serious alarm. Her insistence on competing and winning against Obama was making him look bad. In time, Joe Klein criticized her insubstantial attack tactics against Obama, claiming that they had damaged her reputation, but that, quote, that was nothing compared with the damage done to Obama, who entered the primary as a fresh breeze and left it stale, battered, and embittered, no longer the darling of his party. It was certainly true that the Clinton camp had thrown some stones. But since when was it owed to any candidate that he or she escaped the dents and dings of political competition? Just as voters and commentators had considered the impact on Hillary's electability of her abysmal strategic team, her personal and political baggage, and her early trouble connecting with voters, it was now fair to evaluate how Obama performed as his, oppo as his opponent got stronger, as he accumulated baggage of his own, as he lost the glint of tender newness. But pundits were sure it was incumbent on Hillary to drop out. When they fantasized about her exit in January, it had been because she had lost Iowa. When Jonathan Alter of Newsweek suggested that she drop out in February, it was because she was likely to be humiliated in upcoming big, big contests. Now that it was Obama who was losing and being humiliated, the prescription, oddly, remained the same. Hillary had to go. It was a media barrage that m the blogger Melissa McEwen dubbed, take your boobs and go home. A New York Times op-ed castigating Clinton for running negative ads about Obama in Pennsylvania suggested, quote, it is getting to be time for the superdelegates to settle a bloody race that cannot be won at the ballot box. Maureen Dowd nudged Hillary to take a cue from an old Dr. Seuss poem that the children's author had in 1974 applied to Richard Nixon. Dowd's verse went in part, the time is now, just go. I don't care how. You can go by foot, you can go by cow. Hillary R. Clinton, will you please go now? On Countdown, Newsweek's Howard Feynman suggested that it was time for, quote, some adult somewhere in the Democratic Party to step in and stop this thing. Keith Olbermann agreed, saying, right, somebody who can take her in a room and only he comes out. A comment that led the Huffington Post columnist Rachel Sklar to headline an item, Olbermann's idea for beating Hillary. Literally, beating Hillary. Olbermann later apologized for his remark, calling it a metaphor. More arresting was an appearance by Ken Rudin, 
on CNN Sunday morning in late April, in which the NPR political editor said, let's be honest here, Hillary Clinton is Glenn Close in fatal attraction. She's going to keep coming back and they're not going to stop her. In evoking Close's character, Rudin was summoning a bunny-boiling virago whose bullet-riddled demise in a bathtub represented one of the most graphic cinematic punishments of aggressive femininity available to the American imagination. So outrageous was Rudin's comparison that it prompted Sunday morning co-host Betty Wynn to suggest, in response to Rudin's admission that he'd been partying all night at the White House Correspondence Center, maybe that explains the Glenn Close analogy. Rudin later apologized, claiming he wished he hadn't made the facile and dumb comparison, but he had created a meme. Two weeks later, Tennessee Congressman Steve Cohen, an Obama supporter whom Nancy Pelosi had once called the conscience of the freshman class, was asked about Clinton's presence in the race. He replied, Glenn Close should have just stayed in the tub. It was as if the id of every guy who'd built up resentments toward powerful women had staged a coup against the superego, making it open season not just on Clinton, but on all noncompliant women. Penn Jillette heartily joked on MSNBC's Morning Joe in May, quote, Obama did great in February, and that's because it was Black History Month, and now Hillary's doing much better because it's White Bitch Month, right? Only a few people were calling foul. At Media Matters, Eric Bullert wrote, Looking back through modern U.S. campaigns, there's simply no media model for so many members of the press to try to drive a competitive candidate from the field while the primary season is still unfolding. Strong second place candidates such as Ronald Reagan in 1976, Ted Kennedy, Gary Hart, Jesse Jackson, and Jerry Brown, all of whom campaigned through the entire primary season, and most of whom took their fights all the way to their party's nominating conventions, were never tagged by the press and told to go home. The media was not presenting the fight between Clinton and Obama as a norm for close presidential races. Instead, we were being told that in continuing to compete with him, in not letting him win, Clinton was behaving like a headstrong child or a demented movie villain. Here were echoes of the strategies that in recent years had bedeviled reproductive rights activists faced with one anti-choice Democrat after another. Couldn't they see that in prosecuting their own self-interested aims, they were imperiling the greater good? That if they would just stand down, Democrats would win, which would be good for everyone, including women. But if they continued to make their self-serving stand, we would wind up under Republican control and everyone would suffer because of them. As with the siren song about anti-choice Democrats, this argument was painful for those of us on the other side of it. Of course we wanted a Democratic president and a Democratic majority. We were liberals, or Democrats, or radicals, or progressives, or whatever we called ourselves, who were invested in reproductive rights or in the Clinton campaign, precisely because we cared about liberal politics, because we believed fervently in making the country a better place for more people. It felt almost sadistic, the maneuverings of those who would trade on our rights or dismiss our candidate early, and then accuse us of undermining a progressive agenda. Uh, those are the sections that I wanted to read. I don't go into too much detail, and there is a whole, and I don't know if this is part of what you're getting at. Um, because the book uses the campaign story, but is not so much, um, I'm not a political beat reporter, so it's not an enormous amount of behind the scenes, there's not an enormous amount of polling information or um, technical stuff. And that makes it sound like it's a stupid book, I promise, it's not. But, um, <laughs> But it's, it's much heavier on the analysis than it is on reporting the individual instances. I don't go into a tremendous amount of detail between the caucus and the primary systems. I know that there was an enormous amount of agitation, and I hear about it quite often still, from Hillary supporters, and you may be one of them, who, I don't know if you were in any of these states, in the, in the tremendously tense tussle over, um, over who was winning the primaries. And in um, the unfortunate story of Florida and Michigan, um, which did not have official primaries or caucuses, and in which, in one state, Obama's, the candidates were not allowed to campaign. It was, a, it was a Democratic National Committee decision that turned out to be so fundamentally disastrous <laughs> um, to people on both sides of the Clinton-Obama split. Um, there was an enormous amount of conversation about whether or not the votes in those states should be counted, whether they shouldn't be counted. There was also an enormous amount of conversation about the, different, the two different kinds of processes we have in our electoral system, and that some states have primaries, some states have caucuses, some t states confusingly have primaries and caucuses. Um, and Obama tended to win the caucuses, and Hillary tended to w win the primaries. And so between um, the two sides, 
and those most vociferously working on behalf of each of the sides. There was an enormous amount of anger and, and lots of accusations about how the system had been manipulated, how it had not been fair. Um, most of the complaints, obviously, were coming from the Clinton side because Clinton was on the losing side of these equations. Um, the way I address it in my book, which you might not be very happy with, <laughs> uh, is only briefly in which at the end, I, I started the race not a Clinton supporter at all. I was a John Edwards supporter, um, which is a shameful thing to admit in retrospect. Um, <laughs> anybody else here should feel free to, to, <laughs> to own up to it now. <laughs> and um, there might be a support club we could start. <laughs> but um, I, was, I was actually quite negative about, about Hillary going in. Um, and by the end, I became quite an ardent Hillary supporter. Um, I was radicalized in part by some of the stuff I was just reading about here, um, and in part because I found both, I found Clinton and Obama to be very similar candidates in lots of ways, and I was, I became increasingly incensed by the, what I felt were the projections of greatness onto him and the projections of horribleness onto her. But by the end, I was an ardent Clinton supporter. And, um, but the, the way I address what I think you're getting at at the end of the book is to say that in my most ardent moments of Hillary support, I was keenly aware that there was no good way for her to win. Even when I was completely in the tank for her, around this time that I was just reading about now, Pennsylvania, which was an ugly contest, um, when I was listening to her and I felt she was such a better candidate than, she, than she'd ever been before, I was so, I couldn't believe, I felt like a silly person, I couldn't believe I was inspired by listening to Hillary Clinton, but I was. Um, but all this sort of intensity of, of support that I somehow managed to generate for her, I absolutely knew there was no way that it could have ended well for her in a scenario in which she won. Now, as it turns out, and we can talk about this more in a few minutes if anybody else is interested, it's really turned out well for her in that she lost, which is a whole different sad equation of its own. But had the stuff that you're referring to, had those people who felt that um, the rules had, that, that, that she'd been cheated in some way, that her supporters had been cheated, that the votes hadn't been counted, had that argument prevailed, I actually believe it would have been as ugly a situation for the Democratic Party as we could possibly imagine. And that's not to say that there was either rightness or wrongness on either side of the argument about who got cheated and who didn't. I actually thought, I knew how screwed up the system was that we weren't counting votes in two states, but to have counted them would have been bad too, to my mind. It would no, I don't think that many people would have felt good about it. And so that's the only way in which I address it, is simply to say I was aware that the arguments that, that Hillary had been cheated were there, and I don't know if they were valid or not. There were also lots of other people who, who talk about bullying at caucus booths in Iowa. I mean, there, there are people who claim to have videotapes of Hillary supporters being pushed out of rooms. I mean, there's, and there's a, there's a spectrum. And it's impossible to tell because people on both sides were so intense about these things. It's impossible to tell who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth and, and what really happened and what really happened on each side. But I don't think that there's a way that the complaints could have been prosecuted that ended with a unified Democratic Party. And that was, even though I was an ardent Hillary supporter, my ultimate concern was I wanted, in the end, a Democratic president. There was a really interesting thing that, thing that happened in New Hampshire, even before the, the tears. Um, you know, Hillary had chosen, here she was, and, and one of the things that's really important to remember, one of the biggest, sort of obvious, but biggest points in my book, no woman had gotten this close to a Democratic nomination in 220 years. Hillary was a first. And we forgot that because, because in fact, um, the campaigning against her was so good, and she, she had been cast by her opponents and by herself as part of a strategy I'm about to detail as practically an incumbent, okay? She was the establishment ca candidate. The reality was she was married to an establishment, but a woman could no more have been the establishment candidate in this country than an African-American man could have been. It just, we'd never had one before. But she had to develop a strategy and, and based on old conventional wisdom, and the advice of her husband's advisors, including Mark Penn, 
and Howard Wolfson and Terry McAuliffe, a group of guys. She did not rely on the, on the team of women who she'd worked with for 20 years in the West Wing of the White House and beyond through her Senate career. Um, she relied on a team of strategists run by Mark Penn, who told her that she should do everything to disguise the fact that she was a woman. We don't elect women president in this country. We do not nominate them for president. We don't vote for them for president. And so the goal was, you're not a woman. You are the, the safe candidate. He, I mean, in retrospect, even in the present, you, you could tell it was a bad strategy. But the result was she was so managed, so contained. Um, there's actually a very moving profile of her, from which I quote liberally in the book, in the New Yorker around the time of New Hampshire, in which she says to the, to the reporter George Packer in the New Yorker something about we're not ready in this country to accept a range of, of expressions from women. We can't, we can't hear women in power or competing to be in power um, express themselves in, in, a, in a range of scales. And so the result was she had been campaigning with this kind of pugilistic, I'm a fighter, I'm in it to win it, I'm going to deck those patsies. In I mean, it was crazy. And it was incredibly unappealing. And then she lost Iowa spectacularly. And of course, part of the strategy behind you're going to run as the safe candidate, as if you've practically been president before, part of that strategy was, and everybody's going to vote for you. Mark Penn was so overconfident. They never bothered, as I, as I mentioned in one of the first readings, they never went after young people. They, it took them months to figure out that maybe they should show up at college campuses. Mark Penn wrote a memo before the race even kicked off saying, Women under 35 are automatically going to vote for you. You don't, you, know, you don't even have to worry about them. You don't need to address them. So they never started to talk to women, except women over 90. That was the only people she could actually talk to, women who were born you know, before 19th Amendment. Um, and, but the assumption was, because all the women are going to vote for you, and you're going to just win. And then she lost Iowa. Um, and she lost Iowa's women, which was shocking. And then there was this week of pylon. New Hampshire had been, uh, Iowa had been the first caucus. And there were five days between Iowa and New Hampshire. And this remarkable thing happened. She'd been campaigning for a year at that point already in this sort of semi-shout, monotone, I'm in it to win it, I'm not a lady, you know, <laughs> uh, mode. And it was such a disaster and so unexpected that she lost Iowa that I think, and, and the media in turn basically said it was over. She's out of the race. She's already, she's losing in New Hampshire by predicted 13 points. She's never going to win New Hampshire. Will she drop out after New Hampshire or will she try to stay in it till Super Tuesday? I mean, they were just, they were dancing on her grave. And I actually think looking back at those five days, and I have a whole chapter in here called Five Days in January about the transformation that took place in those five days. She thought she was going to lose. And uh, she totally let go of every bit of the strategy. And if you, it wasn't, it wasn't just the emotion. It wasn't just the tears. It was, she used the word sexism. It was in New Hampshire that those guys stood up with Iron My Shirt banner. And she said, and she, believe me, she had never said the word sexism before. The point was we were not supposed to talk about sexism. We were not supposed to acknowledge that she was a gendered or different candidate. Um, but those guys stood up and she just cracked like a joke because Hillary actually has a sense of humor, not that you'd ever been permitted to see it before. Um, you know, ah, the remains of sexism, alive and well. And then at the end of the, and it, I mean, she said sexism. This was a breakthrough. And at the end of that rally, she offered to teach anybody who was still unclear on how to iron a shirt, how to do it. And uh, the next day, she, um, she was being interviewed by Chris Matthews who had this like, uh, fetishization obsession with her and her defeat and she totally joked with him she's like I just don't know what to do with men who are obsessed with me and it was so out of character for Hillary she was just cracking the, I mean except it's anyone who knows her says this is precisely who she is um, but she hadn't when she was strategizing campaigning thinking she was gonna win none of that part of Hillary was allowed out and then in these days where she was tired, she thought she was going to lose, and she just let it all hang out. And that's where the tears came. Um, and the argument about how they were absorbed is a more complicated one. Um, they, she didn't, first of all, I should just clarify, 
there wasn't crying. There was not, there's not one bit of water that left the, <laughs> you know, her eyelid <laughs> and hit another surface. Um, she did tear up and get congested um, and talk about, you know, how, how hard this was and she was in it, for, it's not just a game. Um, and it was in a moment, a moment that many people saw as emotional. And if you read, and then she surprisingly won that night by a huge margin. And if you read the coverage, from the next morning. It's all about how as I, she won the women's vote because women love nothing more than to see other women crying. <laughs> and, uh, and that, you know, they, they cleave to weeping Hillary like golden girls to cheesecake. And that this was the moment of feminine connection. By the way, none of those stories, and I, we're talking about one in the New York Times, one on CNN, um, one on a ABC, but there are dozens more. Mention in the roundup that Hillary won New Hampshire that it was the first time in American history that a woman had won a primary. They don't even mention it as a like piece of trivia. Um, but there are all kinds of paragraphs on how women just love other women crying. And I actually think that what happened in those days that culminated maybe with that moment was that she had gone to such lengths to show us that she wasn't different from any of the other candidates and that therefore her race was not historic. She was just, she'd been president before. Had, didn't you remember the Clinton administration? Um, and that she wasn't a woman. That, that many people didn't recognize her as such. And it wasn't that crying made her somehow more essentially female. It was that that period of days that led to her exhaustion, that led to her being able to express herself. It wasn't that she was essentially female, it was that she was being treated like a woman. The media was piling on her, they were mocking her, they ran that clip of Hillary crying. I mean, and you would think, the people talking about her sobbing, um, <laughs> you know, all over the place, they mocked her. Um, they celebrated what they assumed was gonna be her impending defeat. And suddenly what was made visible, which her campaign had gone to great lengths to make invisible, was the fact that she was doing something that had never been done before and that there was resistance to it. And it was that. I, I wrote a piece at the time, and, and I draw on that in this book, and again, I was an Edwards supporter. I actually sort of couldn't stand Hillary. But that week, based on what I was seeing on television, I would have moved to New Hampshire and pulled a lever for her in a heartbeat. I was so furious. Because, and what had been, what had been shown to me was the sexism that, sh that Ironically, her campaign had gone to such great lengths to pretend didn't, didn't exist. So, I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> Everything's changed. Didn't you notice? When did you not notice the female president? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I should say that it is the, the election that changed everything for American women, not the election that fixed anything for American women. <laughs> change, change. Um, I think a million things have changed. I think the fact that we're having this conversation. Um, I think conversations we might be having about Sarah Palin and Christine O'Donnell and Sharon Engel um, and Carly Fiorina and Meg Whitman and Alex Sink in Florida um, and the way that women are being talked about. And I'm not talking that it's some net good. I mean, it seems very likely that there's going to be a net loss in terms of how many women are in Congress. In, in January, which is terrible, the first time since the 70s that that'll happen. I'm not talking about like suddenly we're in a world populated by female politicians. But what, what is in the air, what is being talked about are the issues of gender and power and leadership. The number of models we have for what a woman might look like as a political candidate, as a fierce competitor, um, as a poten potential leader, have not only doubled and tripled I mean, they've expanded a hundredfold in the past three years. And the conversations that we have about them, the fact that, I mean, if you go on Slate today, for instance, I just happened to see this before I walked out the door, there is like a round table of 20 women talking about who gets to be a feminist, kicked off by questions about Sarah Palin. Um, we were not having, I, I've been covering gender and, and the media and politics and entertainment for seven years. And I can tell you that when I started writing about this beat. A, there was nobody else doing, at that point, doing the job that I was, except for Katha Pollitt at The Nation, and she was writing really more of a political column. It wasn't really about these conversations about where feminism was in, in pop culture, for example. Um, 
there are now there is coverage everywhere. My my publication salon has broadsheet. Slate has double X. Um, you know, Washington papers have have sections called the sexist. Texas Monthly has in the pink. There are now there are now there's a legion of feminist reporters. There's now the feminist blogosphere, which certainly functions for some people and doesn't for others. Um, but also, we have all these models. Again, three years ago, we had had one woman ever on a major party ticket. Um, and it was Geraldine Ferraro, and it was, it was 24, 26 years ago. 26 years ago now. Um, now we've had three. I think it quite likely we will have a fourth in a couple years. <laughs> Um, and maybe a fifth, if the rumors about Clinton and Biden switching are true. Um, this is, things are changing at a rapid rate. And again, I don't mean to suggest that they're all getting better. But we are moving toward a, toward a world in which envisioning who women leaders might be. And by the way, that they might come in all kinds of dismaying and cheering shapes, sizes, and ideologies. Um, is becoming more apparent to us. And that's part of the equation, too. I mean, one of the things that I talk about a bit in the book is that when you're shut out of p power, and this isn't just women, this is racial, ethnic, sexual minorities, when you're shut out of power, you get to develop all kinds of fantasies about how perfect it will be when you one day are in power. And that's why we had sort of bumper sticker fantasies about the first female president, that there'd be no war. And she'd be so collaborative. <laughs> and she'd stop and ask for directions. <laughs> you know, like, and and that's, the, that's the consolation prize for actually never getting a female president. <laughs> you get to imagine the perfect one. And that was actually something that Hillary really ran up against with feminists. Even feminists of her own, the people who had connected to her most fiercely for, for decades. Because she had, in, in maneuvering to become the first woman who could get close enough to the presidency, she had lost everything related to perfection. <laughs> and so she didn't meet what was a very high bar that almost no one really running for president is ever going to meet. And we had to really get over that. And now people like Palin are forcing us to get over it even more. But, but the truth is, if we ever are going to get closer to anything like political parity, what we have to understand is that female candidates will come in all the same varieties as male candidates will. They will be brilliant, and they will be stupid, and they will be corrupt, and they will be pure, and they will be right, and they will be left. And, and that's part of what we're seeing explode in front of us right now, is an expansion of those kinds of models. And I think that ultimately that's really good for all of us, even though the short-term uh, choices may not be so good. 